Ready to go, son? Yeah, let's do it. What's up guys, Mr. Fly here and I am here with Kieran, the biomechanist on Instagram. As you should know, show up, look at the way. Mm-hmm. Alright, so we're going to do a little bit of Q&A um, and just a little bit about Kieran. So if you want to go, let's have a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so my name's Kieran, as I said, I'm the biomechanist on the score PhD on Instagram. Um, so initially, I suppose, how I got into to fitness and sport in general, I started off as an athlete. Um, so as a sprinter, um, a hurdler, competed at quite a high level. Um, and as I was doing that, I was always studied, also studying to be a sports scientist in DCU. Uh, so I did a four year degree in sports science. Um, towards the end of that degree then I was running pretty fast, picked up a few injuries, um, so couldn't really compete anymore. But um, very, very competitive by nature as I'm yeah. <laughs> probably aware of this nature. So I got into kind of the physique side of things and trained in a physique kind of style for two or three years while I was doing my PhD. Um, then I finished up my PhD, you know, um, PhD was in biomechanics. Um, so in terms of biomechanics, it's largely looking at how the body moves, trying to manipulate it in different ways to either improve how it functions or to, to reduce the risk of developing injuries and that type of thing. Sweet, and you're lecturing in, in Atlone IT at the minute, right? Yeah, I'm lect- now I'm currently lecturing at Atlone IT on the, the sports science degree and on the athletic therapy degree, which is a kind of a sports physio. Sweet, and your training at the minute program. is like... Solely based around like sort of sprinting at the minute, though, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's very much targeted towards sprinting. Um, I kind of decided maybe three or four months ago. I'm getting a little bit older. <laughs> um, for once, I'm I'm in a healthy place with my body, so I said I'd, I'd give it another little bit of go. Sweet. Um, but still, I've learned a lot from the kind of physique training we've done over the past yeah, few yeah. years. Um, still implementing quite a lot of that type of stuff into my training. And um, number one, although it's probably not the most conventional way to train for sprints, definitely helps in terms of keeping my body healthy. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah definitely. It's definitely a very balanced approach to training. That oh, is isn't really there yeah. with um, typical sprint training. Yeah. Um, and then the sprint training is obviously very high intensity on the track, so it's really good for fat loss. So it keeps you, keeps you quite lean. Yeah, keeps me very lean. Fuckers always the keeps me <laughs> Okay guys, so we're gonna get straight into the questions now, and we're gonna start off with, what's the first one you got? Okay, number one. Um, any tips for a 16 year old to get leaner and stay lean? Um, Go for it. You, you, you can take that one. Um, well, first of all, I think my opinion definitely would be, and I tell this to everyone, if you're 16, if you're still pretty young, I wouldn't worry a huge amount of, in terms of really targeting your training to stay lean. Work on building some muscle, use that kind of, that phase where you, you can't really get yeah, too fat. Yeah, you, you literally can't do that. To, well. to your benefit, eat like a motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, eat crazy amounts. Train yeah. like a, train your ass off, just enjoy it really. Yeah, um, pizza. Learn to, to enjoy your training at that stage, and if, if you can get that, it's much easier to sustain if you're yeah, trying exactly. to I would say, yeah, definitely exactly the same opinion. More so that uh, when you're young, you utilize, I suppose, that, that growth factor element. Your body is still growing, your body, your testosterone levels are through the roof, your, your turnover, your metabolism is, is going mental at that yeah. stage. You know, you have you obviously have youth at your side, so so you use it to that advantage, and don't really worry too much about the um, about the getting lean side. Just train your ass off and eat to fuel your body. So, mm-hmm. biggest things I would say is just uh, protein with each meal, yeah. and uh, make sure that you're consuming enough calories, um, for your weight and, and your size. Yeah. Um, top three things yourself and Iron have learned. Oh shit. Oh, that's a big one. Um, you can take one. I suppose. From a, in terms of being helpful, the number one thing that that's made a huge difference to me is just learning to be flexible with my diet. Yeah, definitely. Um, if it fits your macros, flexible dine is it's an amazing tool. No, <laughs> I have seen it being misused where people become too anal with their, oh, their yeah, macros. Yeah, like completely, yeah. They don't hit three hundred and ten grams of carbohydrate in a day, and their diet is not good. Yeah. Um. So be flexible, and um you'll see huge progress, and that's definitely better. Yeah, so my, my, I suppose my top three things that I've learned was uh, don't demonize any food. Yeah. Um, probably uh, carbs aren't the enemy, calories, overconsumption of calories is. Um, and yeah, just to be flexible and not, I suppose, mm. be over, uh, overanalyzing every move. And, and don't, I suppose, 
focus on the on the good things rather than the you know the minuscule bad things that you do in, in your diet like in the overall i suppose let's say a seven day a week diet or yeah, like, you know absolutely. focus on the, on the good things that you've done rather than the uh, the little minuscule mock-ups that you might have had or the little mishaps that might have yeah. had, occurred in the week yeah. one of the other things then this whole idea of healthy foods or unhealthy foods i think a little bit of a fallacy in a lot of respects yeah 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 big time. um if there's like some foods out there that, are, that you can eat on a day to day basis, fit into your macros, and it's going to help with adherence, mm -hmm. sustaining in that calorie deficit, big time. Um, for a long period, eat them, enjoy yeah, them. Definitely. Um, stay in a positive frame of mind. Mm -hmm. Don't get bogged down in yeah. the kind of healthy, unhealthy. Yeah, big time. Yeah. What area of study have you focused on and what's been your greatest learning? Um, okay, so my degree was in sports science, as I mentioned, and yeah. subsequently then I studied, I did a PhD in biomechanics and exercise physiology. Um, so we kind of covered the biomechanics stuff at the start from an exercise physiology point of view. Um, so far to date, my research has been much largely focused on how manipulation of mechanics. So if I change someone's running style to run from one way to another, what effect will that have in terms of their energy consumption when okay, they're running okay. that way? So will it increase the amount of calories <laughs> they burn when they run with new mechanics? Will it decrease them? Um, so, so like I said, like more efficiency is, is less kind of energy output. Nearly. Yeah, it's exactly. Efficiency over output, kind of. Yeah, efficiency over output, and then. Mine would have been from a, a clinical perspective, I suppose, as opposed to performance in that, okay, they're moving differently in a way that might reduce their likelihood of developing an injury. Oh, I guess. But the added bonus is now, it's not an, you know, it's not an efficient movement plan, it's they're burning those calories. Sweet. But that's not a negative. Yeah, yeah, with a lot I guess. Of you know? Sweet. If you have time, we'd touch on less reps, higher reps versus more reps, less weight, and your thoughts, especially if fat loss is your goal. Um, um, I'd be kind of teetering on the volume side of things, if weight loss is your goal, yeah. um, I would be more sort of inclined for the intensity sort of volume side of things because again, if, you, if you're working on strength, you're, you're not going to be in the gym for a long period of time. Um, the sort of hypertrophy 8 to 12 rep range is, is ideal for, I suppose, building muscle and staying lean. So I suppose the, I wouldn't favor strength training if I was trying to get lean. Um, that that wouldn't be my my approach now. Yeah. Like again, like I'm I'm open to criticism, but that wouldn't be my personal approach. If I was trying to get lean, I'd be aiming towards the you know yeah. eight to twelve rep range and yeah. the the sport more volume, um in, in your yeah, training. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose more intensity in your training rather than I suppose you know doing, uh you know three to six reps and and taking huge breaks, which is what strength training is kind of is, you know. So yeah. that would be my kind of opinion on it. Yeah, definitely. No, and I think um does. And we've said those times many ways to skin a cat. If strength training is something you really, really enjoy, do it. Well, yeah. do that at the start. And if you're not burning as many calories as you need, then do some more of that kind yeah. of bodybuilding yeah. and virtually yeah. style stuff towards the end of your session. Yeah, sweet. Okay. What's the best way to go from ectomorph body to get the build of a GA or rugby player? Wow. Oh. Christ. Um, a rugby player? GA yeah. and rugby player? Well, no, I don't think you can. You can't there's no change. Body cap, yeah. You can't really change your body type. Um, and what you can do, I suppose, is manipulate your diet. Yeah, and manipulate your, your diet, and I suppose, and you train it to suit the style of uh, sport you're going to do. So, for instance, like you're not going to train like a powerlifter or eat like a powerlifter if you're going in to play ga on a Sunday. Do you know it, it's just not going to happen? They're two conflicting trainings. So, if you're doing, you know, five sets of five for strength, or you know, you're working on one rep maxes all the time, and you're yeah, you're taking definitely. long duration like. Like if you try to go out onto and you're eating as well like a powerlifter, you're like you know you're when you go out onto a pitch, you're not gonna be able to last a, an eighty minute game, game or a, you know a, a, an eighty or ninety minute game or whatever. It's like eighty, 80 minutes for a GA match. Yeah, yeah it's nice like, for soccer. Yeah. So 80 for rugby. so like it's it's just two conflicting training. So like what I would do is probably work on I suppose that yeah. muscle endurance sort of like I suppose the twelve to twenty type range. Um, and, and work on that and then work on muscle endurance because essentially that's the type of training you're going to or the type of I suppose output you're going to be doing you're going to be doing sort of muscle endurance type stuff yeah definitely and yeah with a little bit of strength obviously worked in there as well to keep you powerful and I suppose explosive, explosive yeah. Yeah. I think as well take advantage of your body type I mean use that to your advantage I mean with all different body types probably disadvantages and advantages oh yeah well, um, and just work with it I don't I would never try and Alter my shape. Alter my shape. Yeah, yeah, to be like someone else. Yeah, big time. Um, okay, so, hi guys. I had an ACL reconstruction and muscle re repair on both the lateral and medial side last Tuesday. I was wondering what macros I should work off and how I should plan out trying to stay lean. Um, 
then some details about himself. He's 16 year old and I've been working hard, but he's afraid he's gonna put on some weight due to a lack of cardio. Um, and he wants to stay in a surplus because he wants to build mass. Um, again, I'm gonna go back to that. You're 16. I really wouldn't worry yeah. too much about being lean, not being lean. Um, at this but stage, being super specific. Yeah. A certain macro yeah. or a certain calorie Calories. requirement. Um, Eat, get, get protein in every meal would be the big one to start with. Yeah. And worry about getting, getting back. back from your ACL. Yeah. yeah. That's do, it. Work and recovery. Like to be it. honest, yeah, you're you're um you're you're out of training for a little while, you're gonna be out for a significant mm. length of time with that injury. So um what I would say is working on getting your, your head right to know that you're going to be out for a fair bit of time yeah. and that there's going to be recovery needed. So I would work on I suppose my mindset and yeah. working with a positive mind frame to get yourself back as quick as possible. So yeah. obviously getting protein in for recovery, getting good meals in, getting enough water in, that you're hydrated well. So, you know, good, well hydrated body is just uh, recuperation and, and regeneration of new cells. Yeah. So you're, you're going to be, I suppose, you're going to be in it for the long run. You're going to pay, you're, yeah. you're, you're more so playing the long game with that one rather than working on the short game. So I wouldn't worry too much about getting lean because I would be worried about now how can I recover quicker and faster? Yeah. So yeah. forget about the lean end of things and work about okay, yeah. work around sort of how can I get back to full health as quick as possible. Yeah. Get into a gym or some type, do some work with a physio or a therapist, do your your rehabilitation. Um, I think that definitely helps being in the gym every so often still kind of working towards a goal. Oh yeah. And the more you do, um, the faster you're gonna you're gonna get back to being able to do the type of training that you want. Yeah, sweet. Firstly, if you're looking to gain lean muscle but drop body fat, what's the best protein supplement to take? Um, secondly, I'm 5'1", 135 pounds, and I've been weight training for about two months, usually about five times a week, and I'm slowly getting muscle but not really dropping body fat. Should I be doing more cardio or faster cardio? Any advice? Thank you. There are all pretty much the exact yeah, same. They're all basically the same. They're all pretty yeah. much the exact same. If you analyze or analyze, but if you look at the macronutrients on the back of any protein packet, or any sort of whey protein, they're pretty much bang on the exact same, unless it's a meal replacement shake, and sure, there's, you know, yeah. and there's you know, four or five hundred calories in it. And um, I wouldn't be too worried about what type. It's just, I suppose, what's the best bang for your buck? As in, like, how much yeah, can I get, and absolutely. for how cheap can I get? It? Yeah. Pretty much that's what I've been working on. Yeah, or just try and eat. Yeah, try yeah. to get your your protein from your food. Your food. Um, and that's going to help because it'll fill you up a little bit more than a yeah. shake. I find. Big time, yeah. Um, the second part then, I'm 5'1", 135 pounds, I've been training for two months and I'm still getting muscle but not dropping body fat. So wants to know should you do more cardio or faster cardio, any advice? Well, how do you know, number one, that you're gaining more muscle? Yeah. So if you're not assessing, you're guessing. So if there's no results, if there's no body fat measurements, if there's yeah. no you know, tape circumference measurements, if there's no, you know, if you're not keeping an eye on your weight, well, how do you really know if you're gaining muscle and not just over consuming calories and getting heavier? Yeah, absolutely. Do you yeah. know, so that's what I'd be kind of worried about. I'd be more so going, right, well, what's the telltale signs of you gaining muscle? Like, yeah. if you gain muscle and get leaner, you'll just automatically look leaner. So, yeah. but if, I mean, if body fat loss is your is your goal here, it's kind of gain muscle and lose body fat at the same time. Yeah. Very difficult to do for a lot of people. Yeah, big time. Almost impossible, so. If, you, if body fat loss is your goal, you need, you're going to need to have a look at your calories. And yeah, you're going to need to be in a calorie deficit for that. Yeah. Um, keep your protein high so that you'll obviously keep gaining that little yeah. bit of muscle as you go on, but I would work on yeah. a calorie deficit. Yeah. And if you want to build in muscle, I mean, the leaner you get, the, the more muscle susceptible it is. Yeah. Abs. It's all a matter of perspective. Okay, so I'm going to the gym, but I don't want to lose weight, I don't want to tone up. What type of diet would you recommend? I think that kind of very similar as well, to what we just talked about. Uh, I would probably just recommend a maintenance diet for yeah. that. Um, find uh, a calorie allowance that you will basically, you won't budge in your weight. So mm. if you weigh yourself and you're 12 stone or whatever, um, and you know you eat 2,000 calories, this is just hypothetically, yeah. um, and you do that for three or four days and you assess it and you haven't gained weight, well then you know that 2,000 calories is your maintenance. Yeah. And you know that you won't budge yeah, in definitely. weight if you're eating that. So to, I suppose, tone up and um, work on a maintenance if you're not looking to lose body fat or lose weight work on your maintenance calories so that the calories that i suppose that you can sustain your current body weight with and yeah. um, rather than dropping body weight or gaining okay. yeah i think the only thing i would add there is depending on your level of training 
you can be quite sensitive to those changes. So myself and Aaron would see change quite quickly at this stage. Um, but if you're new to training, it can take up to like maybe two weeks to see. Yeah. It. So give give the calories. Yeah, two give, weeks. Yeah, give it a week. Give it. See what happens. Have a little bit of patience yeah. with it as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so just wondering for your question and answer. Whilst in a calorie surplus, trying to build muscle, what do you suggest for ad work? Or ab work, sorry. Um. Okay. We still so, alternate, don't we? Yeah. So when myself and Kieran are training together, we normally alternate some of the core work that we do. We do sort of. Uh, like really heavy weighted stuff one day, we do really high rep ranges one day, we do a lot of um, like ab rollouts, roll um, yeah. sort of anti extension work, is it? Yeah. Um, so, like uh, ab rollouts, planks, like transverse abdominal, your deep abdominal muscle work. Yeah. Um, so, we kind of try to mix it up yeah. as best as we can, don't we? Yeah, no, my training would be very much core strength focused, large, because I've hasted quite a lot of kind of abdominal flexion crunches um, and I've had a disc bulge as a mm-hmm. result of that type of training. Um, so working on, as Aaron said, anti-extension, so things like rollouts, planks, working on anti-rotation movements, so like things like the landmines. Yeah. Um, so stuff even, that's going to really strengthen, I suppose, yeah. the deep abdominal muscles rather than just working on the aesthetic side of things. Yeah, and if I had to choose my number <coughs> two, or two exercises, I'd start with squats and deadlifts yeah. for, for core development. Big time. And then, this is your own. Yeah, evidence-based practice, uses and abuses in the applied setting. Um, I'll leave this one to you. Okay, so... This is a this is one that we could probably make a full YouTube video on by itself. Um, but I think we'll start off with some this is if you follow my Snapchat, I'll put it in the link below. Um, you'll have probably heard me rant about this a little bit in the past. Yeah. Um, the, it's really just not so much that people abuse it, abuse um evidence based research, but the fact that they, they don't understand it correctly in the first place. And then they just stick a link in. And yeah, and they just stick a link in. Yeah, and I think the big thing that it comes back to is because it's the thing that people tend to avoid because they don't like it is the stats and not understanding statistics properly. Um, so what should you, like, so when you're looking at evidence-based, like, I suppose, work, what is it that you should be looking out for? Yeah, so I mean, I know a lot of people can't do this and that's where things like podcasts and that will come in very, very handy, but yeah. if you're reading a research paper, I think it's really important, especially this is what this is my what I would do is um I would go skip the intro or I might read the intro, but I usually I usually don't to be honest. Um I go straight to the methods to the to the results and the results section. And then I'd form my own opinions on that data. Okay. Based on what the results were, based on the statistics. And then after I've decided, okay, this is how I would interpret that data, maybe then I'd go and have a look at the discussion. And oftentimes you'll find the way you interpret something is very, very different to how the author yeah, has interpreted it. Yeah, the yeah. research is written. Like, yeah. Now, that's, I'm not saying my interpretation is correct and theirs is wrong. In fact, oftentimes I'll read theirs and say, okay, I see that their point and it adds something else to, to what I thought. Um, but oftentimes, stats are done very, very poorly. But even like, you know, what, like, I suppose some of the questions that I get a lot is, or mm-hmm. what I see a lot on social media is more so that you know, people will say, well, you know, where's your evidence? Where's the science about that? And then people just like Google a study and then yeah, throw and it throw in, in and like throw it in. It's like, well, there. And, and it's like, well, that's your yeah. argument. Well, it's not really, you didn't no. really research that. Exactly. You just yeah. Googled it. Googled. You know that's like, hugely misleading. And it's like, that's a straw man argument. Like, you know, yeah. it's, it's just, well, well, here's something I Googled. Well, yeah. that doesn't really, yeah. do you understand what you just Googled? Yeah. yeah. And I think it's all, that's almost just as dangerous as people just, Throwing out stuff that has no evidence. Yeah, no, because it's, it's, it's the same thing. You don't understand what you're yeah. on about. And you don't, yeah. I think the biggest thing, is, and it's the most basic thing in stats, which people look to, and if you know a little bit about stats, this is what they turn to, and they're like, oh, look at this, this was a significant result. Um, the same thing is like 0.5. So, it's like, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so, what that basically means is, so you see a p value of less than 0.05. So, that means that they've decided that they're. The margin of error, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, so that means that there's less than a 5% chance. That the results that they found were due to error. Okay. Right. Okay. But think about this logically. Who decided that five percent was going to determine the right thing. if something yeah. was effective or not effective? It was like the high overload of research. Yeah. Came down and decided like what's the difference between point zero five percent and point zero five one percent to yeah. determine. So what we get then is um, you'll get studies. I think these the best example um just because of how hard hitting is. You'll do a study on 10 people, your results will be, you get a p-value of 0.25, which means, and a lot of people will say, okay, that's not that's, significant, it doesn't yeah. matter, but those 10 people have just been cured of cancer. Yeah. But it's clinic, or statistically insignificant, so there's a huge difference between um, something that's clinically significant, even in terms of what we would do, that type of research, right, yeah. versus something that's significant in applied setting. I get you. 
Um, because then you'll see the opposite as well, where you'll you'll see a study that has maybe sixty subjects. They they get significant findings, but I mean in applied setting, those results don't mean anything. Yeah, yeah. Or so, they're uncontrolled. Like you'll yeah. find that their studies, like you know, like the the subjects came back and they were uncompliant, or there was yeah. you know people dropped off, and the initial study like started off with two hundred people and then yeah. it dropped to one hundred and fifty or one hundred and twenty, yeah. or you know, so you have yeah. loads of margins of errors in yeah. these studies as well. Like so. Yeah. I, I wouldn't just take it for face value. Like no, you've got to be really, really be critical of everything you read. Next question. So if, if you're using, if it fits your macros, then how necessary or beneficial is carb cycling if you're not actually prepping for competition or or not near your ideal body fat anyway? I think if you're not prepping... Can't so you just watch Matt Ogre's chat? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. I think if you're not prepping for competition, you just need to find whatever it makes it easier for you to adhere to that to your exactly. macros so, or your, your calorie deficit yeah so. for me is the the adherence thing like i said mm. and longevity of a diet i suppose i spoke about this in, the, in in a previous video and it was what's the best diet and i suppose the best diet is the one that you can stick to for the longest period of time so mm. if you're i suppose in a you know nutrition or if you're in a calorie deficit and you know you're hating life you can't go out with your family you can't you know yeah. Do you want anything with your friends? Like it's it's just a sh it's just, just just horrible. Like it's terrible, yeah. and that diet in turn is just not going to be successful. No. So the the carb cycling thing, I wouldn't really go too much into the in depth method of it. But what I would do is I would try find something that suits your lifestyle because there's no point in yeah, us absolutely. sitting here and saying that carb cycling is the way to go when, like your job, your life, your kids, your family, your you know everything yeah. in your life just might not allow that. Yeah. So. You know, you gotta look at every situation, and like myself and, and, and Kieran, like our 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 lives might be able to do, like you know, because of our schedules and because we have that little yeah. bit of flexibility, we we can do carb cycling and we can do you know yeah. different pro dieting pro protocols. But your diet or your lifestyle may not allow yeah. you to do that. So what I suppose we would say is to find the, uh, the the ideal one that suits your lifestyle and your yeah. your requirements. Yeah. Just wondering if you have any tips on trap development. Um, I've been shrugging like a motherfucker. <laughs> and all I end up with is a sore neck and shoulder joints. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> I need help with the um, You can only imagine that. <laughs> okay, so um, I suppose the, big, the first thing to point out here is traps are really quite a large muscle group. And yeah. People tend to neglect kind of the yeah, lower the lower aspects. Yeah, the traps. Everyone yeah. wants the, the big fucking tongue body traps yeah, yeah. up top. Um, so in terms of function, I suppose the first thing that they do is to elevate, and that's where people do a lot of mm. those sugar work. Yeah. Um, and if you want to develop that side of things, so that's the first job. Second is then to depress, so that's the lower parts of the, think, yeah. the traps. So in terms of the upper half, if you can't shrug, I mean, if you do any pressing movement, you're going to get a bit of trap. Yeah. Also, think. any kind of dumbbell raise, once you go past the shoulder, you're going to bring in a lot of trap as well. Yeah. Any um, face pulls, high pulls, like yeah. anything like that sort of stuff. Like if you get high pulls or low pulls, yeah, and um, they're gonna smash your upper traps. Yeah, well. and then any really for your lower traps, any type of pulling action because they work to depress. Yeah, so from, yeah, more mid trap wrong way. Yeah, yeah, they'll like I mean a lap pull down. Obviously, your lats are your biggest muscles in terms of keeping but, your scapula pull down. Yeah, but but yeah, your, your lower your traps bits, yeah. do a huge amount of work there too. Yeah, big time. Yeah, so just general. Vary the exercises up as much as possible. Is what we're saying. Yeah. So yeah. don't just do shrugs and expect cobra traps in a week. Mm. Like just vary as much as you can. And what I would do is like, uh, if it's a weak point, if it's something that you actually yeah. can't build up, well then do it two or three times a week. Yeah. And vary those exercises from day to day. Yeah, I mean it's one of those awkward ones. Kind of fits. It can fit into a pull or a push day. Yeah, so it you can throw a little bit of an exercise in yeah. both days if it is a weakness. Big time. Okay. What are your favorite podcasts? Oh man, okay. I'll nip out. This is my shit. Okay, I'm gonna get to my podcast right now. So Phil, uh, Phil Graham is at the bottom. I also listen to Phil, uh, Phil Learning as well. He's not on that list as well, because he hasn't put up one in a while. So Phil Graham is at the bottom. Lewis House, so that's the School of Greatness. He has loads of cool people talking on it. Um, Upgraded Ape Show, uh, Danny Lennon. That's insane for like you know nutritional based evidence. Or evidence-based nutritional stuff. Yeah. Am I right? Evidence-based nutritional stuff. Um, and then you have the uh, London Real guys. They have just really cool people talking. Oh, really yeah. Awesome. So London Real, Sigma Nutrition, Upgraded Ape. Yeah. Um, School of Greatness with Lewis Howes, and then Elite Muscle Radio, Phil Graham. I'll put all the links in the description box anyway, so you can get them all. And then my, I'm gonna be honest here. I tend not to listen to huge amount of podcasts. Um, yeah. And that kind of comes back to what we were talking about earlier. 
nature of my job is I have to lead, read a lot of research on a day-to-day basis anyway, so... So it's like listening yeah. to work. Oh, it's like listening to work. And I enjoy, yeah. as I said, forming my own opinions and things. Yeah. Um, so I don't really listen to podcasts. But, but for the general public, uh, to go and get sort of, I suppose, evidence-based nutritional advice and evidence-based nutritional work broken down, Danny Lennon's Sig Nutrition is, yeah. is top of the pile. So, yeah, that's, what, that's it. Job <laughs> done. 25 minutes. Yeah. But yeah, job done. So, excellent. Thanks very much, guys. If you yeah. enjoyed it, give this video a thumbs up, please. And uh, hope we answered all your questions. Yeah, be time. And get us on Instagram, Mr. Fly and Biomechanist underscore PhD. I'll put the links up here. And Snapchat, Aaron Smith PT. And Kieran OC. Job done. Yeah. See you guys soon.